Our speaker tonight is co-chairman of the Bahamas Chamber of Commerce and Employer, Employers Federation's Coalition for Responsible Taxation. In the past 10 years, when he has not been busy receiving awards and being a speaker at seminars and training sessions, he has been second VP of the Bahamas Institute of Chartered Accountants. He has also found the time to become a partner at Price Waterhouse. We are indeed privileged to have him speak to us tonight on a subject that all of us are, have heard about, but would rejoice to learn of its demise. Please, a warm welcome for Mr. Gowan Bow. Um, good night all. I, I I think Dr. Sweden summed it up right because my partners at PwC still ask me if I work there um, because they said they only see me from time to time and I had some of my international colleagues call a couple of weeks ago said they've been looking for me. My senior partner said no you have to call the radio stations or the TV houses he's not here. Um, before I start uh, it was interesting when I saw what Rick put up on the website and he said an evening with Gowan Bow. so I had a lot of explaining to do with my wife because he said evening with who and, and what type of women um, so I said, I'm not sure. I know Rick is there, so I'm not too certain on that one. And then I started to think about, well, am I serenading everyone? Is this going to be a musical interlude? So only Rick could make talking about VAT sexy. I can't in my own mind. So I, my, my own mind. So I really give him credit for that. But to start things off, and I think put us into the perspective of where we are, and I have just up on the screen, and then I'll switch into the slides. In 93-94, this was where we were as a country in terms of our recurring expenditure and revenue. And you can see that we had a small deficit of about 13 million. And then overall, we had a GFS deficit of about 11 million. And our debt was just about 1.1 billion. And this was in 93, 94, 20 years ago. Roll the clock forward 20 years. Where do you think we are today? And anyone can shout out in that regard. So you can see almost 5 billion in debt. But look at where we are with our deficit. So we're running almost 450 million. And if you go back a few years, the unfortunate trend is we were at 363 million all the way coming up to 450 million a year in terms of our GFS deficit. And that's very sobering. And I always start from the first perspective. I know 20 years has passed. And so we've had inflation, price increases. But I ask the question, on the recurrent expenditure side, going from 600 million to almost 1.8 billion, almost three times, have we had a tripling of the quality of service from the government? Have we had a tripling of the benefits we receive from the government? Have we seen a tripling in our salaries? Right? Have we seen anything that justifies a tripling of expenditure? And from that perspective, one of the things when we started on the coalition, we started with saying the Coalition for Responsible Taxation, and it very quickly moved into, well, fiscal reform. Because what we quickly realized was we weren't going to solve this equation on the revenue side alone. Because if we got into this problem by the spending, then we're only going to get out of it by correcting the spending as well. And it's very important that we continue as citizens to stress that to the government. They keep arguing with me, and every time I see them in the hallways, um, they, they say, you know, remember the government is not like a household. And I keep saying to them, remember the government is like a household. Because, you know, if in our households we can't spend more than we earn, the only benefit the government has is it can borrow on future generations where we don't want to. So as a family, we don't want to put the burden on our children and our grandchildren. We want to leave it better for them as they move forward. And the government should be thinking the very same way. And so that's sort of the premise. And as I said, I'll move into the, the slides from that perspective. But it was very sobering. And the time I've spent in recent times with the coalition has been very telling. Um, the, the fortunate thing is I've got to meet um, a number of government officials and cabinet ministers. And the unfortunate thing is I've got to meet a number of government officials and cabinet ministers. Um, and from that perspective, there's no disrespect. It's now realizing that these aren't demigods. These are just individuals like us. And the important thing to stress to them is becoming a cabinet minister does not make you all knowing. Um, you still know the same information you did before election and before appointment. 
And so you need to ensure that you trust those around you who are willing to offer sobering advice. So from the coalition's perspective, who are we? Uh, the Band of Merry Men. So the coalition is a, is a part of the Chamber of Commerce, as Dr. Sweden said, and it comprises right now 400 member businesses, and this is the Chamber, sorry, and this is run by a board of directors, and you can see the Chamber management. So a lot of persons in the room, I'd imagine, know the Chamber. And the coalition is 17 major associations, four family island chambers, and led by two co-chairs, myself and Robert, and what we found is it's actually representing near 700 major businesses and 65,000 employees. So put into the context of having 160,000 in the workforce or thereabouts, we do represent quite a significant part of the workforce. And when you see some of the members, you'll see why that number is so high. And we always stress that the coalition is not an entity in and of itself. It's really to represent the Bahamian society. Um, there is a... a, a distrust from the community about businesses just as it is with, with, with governments. The general community says, well, governments only want to tax me to spend my money and businessmen only want to make profits off of my spending. And so there has to be a setting aside, if you will, a little bit of those differences and bringing everyone together and say, well, how do we make the Bahamas the best place? And if we do it in the right way, then all of us should benefit from it and we don't have to have the divide that we once had. So these are the membership when you look at the association. So you can see starting with the Bahamas Hotel and Tourism Association and they took a while coming around and we can see they have their own plans and they are always going to be negotiating in their own environment because they um, have such a significant element of the GDP. But they actually ended up seeing that the coalition was a very non-political, non-combative group. Now we say that, and we, we, we know we have Rick on there, so we always have to be very careful with Rick. And I remember very early on, um, I had something in the press, and I was deemed to be a rebel, and, and Rick said, well, welcome to the club. So I, I remember my grandmother telling me, be mindful of the company you keep. <laughs> so who are we as, the, chain, as the, the coalition? So as we said, the board of directors and as the co-chairs, and each of the chairpersons from the various societies represent their society. And we are concerned about, as I said, it started from the perspective of tax reform, and you'll see that, but it very quickly moved into fiscal reform policies and what was going to happen to the economy. If you ask what was the most daunting um, revelation that came to light as we started this process, was we didn't have a, an extensive study carried out specific to the Bahamas to speak about VAT and the alternatives. But yet we were making such a radical decision or a seismic shift in our tax base without really having a grand appreciation for what it would do. After the announcement was made, we had the IDB study. And the IDB study, in all fairness, is a very credible report, but it was backward looking. So it looked at, and uh, I'm quoting from economists here, so don't quote me outside of here, counterfactual. But I think in layman's terms, it was just saying, well, this is what happened in this society between 2001 and 11, and what would have happened if we had VAT in place? Now, it was dynamic, it did have shifts, what would it be if we had different rates, etc. but that was the first study. And if we think about making a major decision, so when you talk to businesses, and I say to them all the time, any small change in PwC is like a nightmare for us, because we go through more preparatory work than we do in the actual transition itself. And it's all designed to make sure that it's a smooth implementation. When we looked at VAT and, and what it proposed to do, there were immediately challenges, concerns that were raised with the Ministry of Finance and other officials. And that still to this day, unfortunately, have not been resolved to the liking or satisfaction of most businesses. You know, it's one thing to say consultation and another thing to talk about dialogue. Has there been Conversations? Yes. Consultation at least implies that there's some to and fro. That you tell me your side, I tell you my side, and we try to come to a median where all of us are upset, because at least if all of us are upset, then nobody happy. We must have gotten to the right answer. But you know, it always seems to come back to, well, this is what we'd planned, this is what we're going to go ahead with. You guys have to get on board. And what we've been stressing to them is disagreement is not Com being combative. 
And we have to mature as a society where we can respect that we have differences of opinion. We have to mature as a society to the point where we can agree to disagree. And I believe that the problem we've had for many years is when we moved into what we called ourselves being independent, we had a limited number of individuals that I would call as the highly educated. And we tend to focus a lot of trust and responsibility in those individuals. And it was always from the perspective, trust me, I know best. Nowadays, you have a much more educated population. Most households, if not all, have one person that has done well at school and aimed to go off to university or has at least excelled in, in a manner at high school where they have greater comprehension and great ability to digest. So now we no longer as a society are sitting back and saying, well, we trust you to do what is best. We're saying, tell me why you've made a decision and allow us to be the judge of whether it's best or not. Don't be so arrogant as to believe that you are the only ones that can make a, a decision or judgment on our behalf. And sometimes that's not easily digested when we have the politicians who've been there for quite a while. So what do we do other than hit the press? I tell them I get all disappointed now because I know my behavior in society. When I see friends and family, they say, well, I don't see you other than when I open the paper. And I know it ain't too long before they say, well, who this fella think he is always in the paper? And I tell them it's not my fault when people call. So I just give an answer. So I'm going to soon stop answering my phone because I know I'm going to be turned uh, into enemy number one. And my doctor told me today when I went for a check, he said, I don't know why you keep ducking coming to me, because Perry Christie does have a hit out on you anyhow, so you can soon be dead, so not, you may as well come now, so at least you know how far you're going to be there. But what do we do? We obtain information. I have never seen so much information in my life, and I'm an accountant, the boring one. The only ones more boring than us and should have more information are the lawyers, so excuse any lawyers in the room. But we've gotten a lot of information. But it's not really just to get it, we evaluate it and verify it because a lot of things are being said what the inflationary impact will be or the increase in prices and I tend to stay away from inflation because it's used in the wrong context but what the price increase impacts are going to be what's going to happen to spending what's going to happen to business margins and sometimes those things are being done on the back of an envelope as, a, as opposed to true analysis and deliberation between those uh, in the government and private sector we provide suggestions, but also alternatives. And, you know, the age-old saying says, if you're not a part of the solution, you're part of the problem. So we don't want to be the ones that are shouting from the rooftops, this is bad, but yet give no alternative or no um, solution. Because then we're no better than the ones who are professing to do this in the first place. Because at least they have an, an option that they are putting forward. We want to collaborate with all stakeholders, and that means the consumers, the government, the business persons, to at least have the greatest appreciation for the issues that are fa facing us. I keep telling them negotiate, now that's a very strong word, particularly when you talk with government, because it doesn't, doesn't work too easily in that regard unless you're bringing foreign money in and sometimes they get away with a lot more than they should in our current uh, environment. But negotiate means to say, well, are we getting to the right answer for us as a society? Are we getting to the solution that we can all digest. And I always remind persons, we're pirates. You know, from Blackbeard, we've been used to piracy, right? And it's very, um, that mindset is there because we still have an element of that, that, that mischief and that Ed would teach, right? And we can still picture ourselves in that regard. And so we're trying to take an undisciplined society and force it to be disciplined overnight. And that's not an easy task. And we have to appreciate, and when I say we, because the government is us, right? They always say you get the government you deserve, and the reason being is because you elect them. So you can't turn around and be um, fussed with it, even if you didn't vote necessarily that way. You have to be supportive once they're in power. So from that perspective, we have to get to the right answer, and we have to discipline ourselves. But paramount to all of this is protecting the economy. We've not yet evolved from what I would call the recessionary times. A lot of persons say this is the new normal. It will never go back to those times, right? When you speak to a lot of economists. So we're not out of the woods yet. Do we want to do something that damages our progress and our actual economic development? Because a rising tide floats all ships. If we can get the economy moving in the right direction, 
then the government has a much bigger pie from which to tax. The tax burden on each of the individuals is lessened, right? Persons feel that the economy is moving. Because I always say to persons, it's still a recession until the man who feels it in his pocket says it isn't. Because until it is changed for his mindset and he can put food on the table, it's still hard times. And if we get ourselves into an economy that is booming, then we would all be better for it. So we have to be careful that our tax system, granted any introduction of tax, is going to cause a negative uh, impact to the economy. Because there's a shift from the private sector into government sector. So it is going to have a negative impact. And it's a bit wrong when persons say, well, this is going to kill the economy, um, as if other alternatives are not going to have some damage. It is only a matter of saying, how do we minimize that and keep the economy moving forward? So we represent the opinion of the coalition, its members, and we're responsible to those persons, right? And that's important because it means as the coalition, we have to set aside some of our personal views. So there are going to be some of us that are deadly opposed to VAT. There are going to be some of those that are, see it as the best solution of all evils. There are some of us who are not going to like the alternatives. But what we are trying to do is come to a consensus about what we think would be the best for the economy, but not based on conjecture, but based on empirical evidence, based on having something behind us that says, when we make an analysis or we conduct an analysis, what is going to be the impact of the economy of the various scenarios? And then we pick the best one. As I said, it's not to get there overnight, but it is very disturbing when we see the level of deficits that we're running. So as a citizenry, we have to really respect that we have to be a part of getting our fiscal or house back in order. So that's going to require some sacrifice from us all. Promote or oppose legislation and other measures that affect the industries and the economy. And when, from that perspective, when we say promote or oppose, it is not for the sake of opposition. It is saying highlighting in the legislation those elements that are deficient. One of the, some of the clauses in the current VAT Act and regulations that really gets under the skin of a lot of persons is, you will be fined and jailed for failure to collect taxes. However, our civil servants allow taxes to be evaded all the time. So you're applying a standard to the citizen that you're not applying to your own house. And that is a big thing. And you know the question is, well, do I start to jail those who are not collecting in the government, we may need bigger jails, or do I relax some of the penalties as it relates to the private sector? Because on day one, there are going to be some implementation challenges. However, the best thing to do is really work through all of these implementation issues. And that's one of the areas where we're talking about collaboration as being so important, that the dialogue has to go two ways. The government knows what its main objective is. The business community knows how it operates. So if both are willing to raise the skirts, if you will, and be a transparent with one another, then there's a greater good that can come out of it because we can close the loopholes as best we see them, and then we can have a greater appreciation for what the government is trying to achieve. So we said understand and examine the implications of tax legislation, identify the tax concerns of each sector, and we'll go through some of these later on, and what we tried to do was not miss the forest for the trees, because every industry, every business is going to have an issue with some form of tax. So we tried to address the very macro concerns that said what were common to nearly all of the various industries and businesses that we represent. And we tried to put that forward to the government so that we have tangible responses. In fairness, they did respond, um, in some cases, very, um, I would say, tangentially, in the sense that it was um, very verbose and, and words, but no tangible movement in terms of how things would be done. But at least we got that started. And so we had some of these things coming back. And we are now stressing that since we have the economic modeling going on, then we need to focus our attention on some of these implementation issues. And that's not to suggest that we've said VAT is the right answer. But we have equally said that we will not fight the dynamic economic modeling results. Because all studies are going to have in him inherent limitations. So it's only going to be a guide. And it's going to form our future recommendations and alternatives to the government. But at least we will have an understanding 
of the various impacts to the economy. So encourage proactive, cooperative, and collaborative dialogue with the government and private sector. I am proud to say that I believe that the dialogue that we've had, no end result, so I will caveat that yet, but I believe that this is the strongest level of dialogue between the government and private sector that there has been in our history, at least in my living history. I'm a lot younger than some. But from that perspective, the, the, the doors have been opened. The, the channels of communication have been established. And what's important is to protect those, but not be um, so afraid that you're uh, afraid to give your views or to be so fearful of any repercussions that you're uh, afraid to give views. It has to be where you are free to say what you believe and to work through it together. And sometimes that's the challenge. And I say to some of the coalition members, yeah, we don't like some of the statements that are being made by government officials, that it, it, it seems to be combative. But you know, one of us has to be the bigger person to start it rolling. And so we don't necessarily have to respond in kind, but we do need to clarify any mistruths or any things that come off as being disingenuous. So how we do so is to be the bigger person. So I believe the collaboration is one that we should be proud of, and hopefully that continues long after this very same debate. Advise the private sector and the government, and I think what's key at the end of it is on the means to implement, train, fund, and educate on taxes. Because our responsibility and duty has now almost increased threefold. Before it was to look at whether this was the right tax. But we've taken on an awesome task. And now after that, whatever the end solution is, we as the coalition and the chamber, the wider chamber, have to be a part of helping to implement that. And the only way that gets done is by helping to train and educate the consumer. I had, I think it was eight students from CR Walker a week ago that came to talk about VAT. Apparently it was coursework for BGCSEs. And the only thing that made me, uh, it really hurt me because I was saying I was 20 years removed from high school and that started to make me feel old. So the best way of feeling old is to speak to young people. But as I walked in, you know, one of the young men said, oh, I know you, you're on TV. So I said, okay. <laughs> so he said, so I said, well, do I talk sense? He said, sometimes. So I said, what do I talk the rest of the time? Say, fool. <laughs> so I said, I, I don't know if I would have ever said that as a youngster <laughs> to someone coming in. But what was amazing was I was so impressed with what they had already read and understood. Because they could tell me what VAT was. They had obviously read it. Now, did they know what the practical implications were for business? No. But I'll give you some of the highlights that we discussed, and it was quite interesting. I asked, how many of you go away to the States and come back? And no matter what you spent, you only spent $300. Everyone put their hand up. So I said, all of you are robbing the government. Everyone put their hand up. <laughs> right? And I said that the government can only provide services if it has revenues. So I said one of the key services is the very benefit that you are, or you, the, the very service that you are benefiting from the public education system. And it started to resonate with them. But you know where it ended was the question, well, Gowan, because I told him the only Mr. Boy knows my old man and those older than me, he said, well, Gowan, what's your view on VAT? Are you in favor or opposed? I said, well, let me ask you. He said, 50-50, this is a very vocal young man, uh, very, very vocal. So I said, why? He said, well, what do you mean? So I said, is it because you have a full understanding, but you're still not sure that it's the right tax, or is it because you don't think you had enough information? He thought, he said, I don't think I had enough information, because I don't know to say if there's anything else that's better. And I said, that's my same conclusion. But it was, it was very heartening to see that a person who's 15, 16 years old, right, is having the same message. And I think that's very powerful to, for the government to have an appreciation for. I've been to COB as well. The COB students have been evaluating VAT. And it's very telling that a lot of them are still coming up as saying, do we know enough? And what the government, uh, we've been stressing to them is, they've been telling us what you can go online and see. VAT, it's a consumption tax. VAT, it's charged at the various stages. VAT, the government collects um, at the end of the day where businesses offset. These are the mechanical elements that everyone knows. What everyone is saying is, but you're not telling me what the other's thoughts you had, what the other alternatives were, why this is going to be best for me versus those, and really, what's the impact going to be me and the consumer? And, a, and an honest statement, right? I met a very wealthy um, businessman, and he apparently was a, a major donor 
to the governing party in the UK and he said, you know what, when he was speaking to the Prime Minister, he said, the Prime Minister said, you know, you'll never win an election by telling the truth. And, you know, when he said it, I said, yeah, you know, that's probably true. But he said, you need to have the truth sayer and the politician. And apparently the Prime Minister said in the UK, that's why they'll never have the Prime Minister being the Chancellor of Exchequer. Because Chancellor of Exchequer is never going to be a popular person. Right? He holds the purse strings. The Prime Minister can promise the world. The Exchequer gives you reality. And that's one of the areas we have to be concerned of when we have seen a pattern of a Prime Minister and Minister of Finance being the same individual. Because they are inherently opposed. The Prime Minister is leading a government and leading a party. And their primary responsibility is for uh, the, 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 the excitement and the, the euphoria of the individuals, the, the, the citizens that they represent. The Minister is the sobering truth, Minister of Finance, of what we can do. This is all we can afford. So what is the government doing, or the coalition doing, about government's proposed introduction? And persons who may have been reading um, the press will see quite a number of things that we've been um, dealing with. We have actually been speaking with the Oxford Economics, and those were the group that we hired uh, as a group of econo economists to come and perform a study with us. We have been dialoguing with tax attorneys and tax lawyers in terms of looking at formulating other alternatives so that what legislative and other implementation challenges may we run into. We have been dialoguing, sometimes very spiritedly, in terms of what are some of the things that the business community see as being the paramount challenges and well, how do we overcome them. So there's been a lot of meeting and discussion and there have been a lot of materials. And if you go to the website www.wakeupbahamas.com, what you'll find is a lot of these materials on there. The submissions that we've been giving, some of the concerns, the issues around fiscal reform, some of the things you want to see the government do. And what you can get a greater appreciation for is that we have been recommending alternatives. We have been speaking with them. And that's why I said, my partners always say to me, they, don't know, they never know where I am. Right? And I always say to them, because of course, the ministry officials always feel that when they want to have a meeting, you drop what you're doing and you come to have a meeting. And sometimes, you know, they're not always the most uh, uh, punctual in terms of coming through. Um, you know, and sometimes I wonder, that's the private sector versus government sector, right? Time is money in the private sector. Um, I charge by the hour. I think by the tenth of a, of a minute as well. Every six minutes I charge. So from that perspective is having that appreciation. But we've been trying to determine what will VAT mean for the consumer. And whilst we know it's not going to be a 15% price increase, that's worst case scenario because from a service perspective it could very well be because it never had a tax on it before. On the good side, you know, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, there may be some trade-off of the duties, et cetera, coming in, but VAT is going to price, increase prices on that front as well. So we're going to have price increases. And for the consumer who is now struggling to make, make ends meet, that's going to be difficult. Whilst we all have to make our contribution, when we talk about regressive and progressive, always remember that VAT is still not progressive. It may be less regressive, is the term that you hear being bantered around now, but it's still going to put a much greater burden on the lower earners than the higher earners because there's only so much you can, can consume, even as a higher earner. So I said, increase the cost of goods and services. A cash-based informal economy is likely to develop. I mean, in reality, in the Bahamas, that already exists, right? Everything is cash. Some of it's called tip. Uh, you know, in the form of gratuity. Um, some of it is, is the fact that when you go to the family islands, if you don't have cash, you're not eating, drinking, or sleeping, because no one has a credit card machine, <laughs> right? Um, but it's, it's going to encourage those persons who are fraudulent or dishonest now to think of creative ways. I go back, history of piracy. So sometimes I say if people spend as much time uh, trying to do right as they do with trying to cheat, we would actually be a, a much further ahead society because we have some very creative individuals. Burden to the family island businesses and consumers. We know it's cheaper to go to the US for travel than it is to visit our own family islands. We know that the cost of living in the family islands 
is compounded by the fact that most things are imported into New Providence and then there's the additional charge to transport it and get it into the economies of the family islands. So there's already an added cost burden for things that get to the family islands. They've expressed considerable concern. Some of that, was, um, some of that fear was allayed when they said that um, I think the, 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 the water transport would be VAT exempt, but in reality VAT exempt is still going to increase prices. It's just, you know, you're not going to get charged at 15%, but it's going to have an embedded price that people can't pass on, and so therefore prices will go up. So they've expressed considerable concern, and a lot of them say, look, our economies still are not back to where they were, and they're very, they're hurting, they're struggling. So we have to be very mindful that we are our brother's keeper. We sometimes become very myopic in New Providence and think everything is around New Providence. And we even say Nassau. Um, but our family islands do need to be thought of. The implementation date and administrative readiness. I said, whenever we do changes in PwC, it's months and months and sometimes years before we make implement changes. Can we realistically implement on July 1? I think cooler heads are prevailing in this one, in the sense that there's a lot more uh, from all of the ministers saying that this date is likely to be moved. But there's some very basic questions. You know, has the government yet installed, acquired and installed the system to run VAT? And anyone who knows about installing systems, what's the one thing you don't want to shortchange? Is the time to install a system. Because it's Murphy's Law, what can go wrong, will go wrong, even if it's just a power system, right? Obama learned that very quickly with Obamacare, you know? Hundreds of millions of dollars spent and on day one flip the switch and some of forget to plug it in, right? It just didn't work. <laughs> Secondly, have they hired the people? So they said, well, the Central Revenue Agency, and there's some talk about, you know, how that is going to be structured going forward. but. You know, there's now greater talk of, well, there's not 100 new persons coming in, we're pulling them from existing ministry. And there's some very bright people in the civil service, but if you're not getting the right skill sets, and they're not the people with the right skill set, are you trying to push a square peg in a round hole? But let's forget who you hire. So you have 100 individuals. Have you really tried, started to train them? Because who in the Bahamas knows anything about VAT, right? conceptually very similar to customs duty in terms of its consumption, but in terms of administration and being able to police the business community, go out and perform audits, identify the differences, be able to enforce the law, that's going to require quite a lot of training. And if you've not yet started, how are you really going to make that July 1 and be effective? Have you engaged the business community in actual interface testing? So how is this going to work? So, you know, how do I register? How do I file my returns? When I pay the money, am I going to wire it, check, or do I have to come with a duffel bag? You know, how are we going to follow up on the audits? How is this practically going to work? And they're saying, we're going to step up the education campaign. Well, it's now the end of March, right? You're saying, even if there's only 4,000 businesses, even if you get 100 businesses in the room each time, right? There's still 40 sessions you have to run. And it's really fool's goal if you believe that each session is a half-day session. I mean, in reality, when you're trying to train and get businesses ready, this is going to be a fairly intensive exercise. So from that perspective, is there even practical time to train the businesses? No matter how much effort you get from uh, the chamber or others in terms of getting it done. Compliance and collection of VAT. You know, very sobering topic, right? The IMF report sort of highlighted and some other um, breaking stories further exacerbated the situation or showed how bad it was, but the IMF said that we're collecting less than 50% of the taxes we have on our books today. Right? Now, I saw some of the numbers that they had, right? And it was considerably less than 50%. So I think they were nice by saying, well, if I start in the middle and just say less than 50, you get the picture, right? But we may, we may be horrified if we knew where they are. And they highlighted real property tax and, and customs duties as the two principal ones. But, you know, in reality, if we're not collecting under the existing systems that we know, then what's going to be the collection rate when we get to VAT and the compliance rate? What I didn't like in the IMF study or the IMF report was they said they believe collection is only going to be about 50% in year one. And I go back to piracy. They don't know Bahamians. If I don't comply in year one, 
Boy, heaven help you if you're gonna get me to comply in year two, three, four, because that sets a precedent, right? We know you only wanted 50% compliance, so let's not get too greedy on this one. So we have, to, we have to project ourselves and we have to be shooting for a much higher compliance rate. And that goes back to the effectiveness and readiness. So we need to get that correct, but in order to get it correct, we have to do our proper homework and analysis. So the compliance and collection is a big issue that we believe has not yet been properly addressed. Private sector training and awareness, like I said, even if it's 100 businesses, and that still is impractical because you don't get the dialogue, the to and fro, so we all know in training sessions, it's very difficult when it's a lecture style, someone standing at the front just um, preaching to you, right? It's far more effective when you're working in groups, you're going through practical examples and doing things that allow you to have a greater appreciation and feel it tangibly. So from that perspective, as I said, that's going to be time consuming. The administration software and uncertainty they spoke to, so I guess I jumped ahead of myself. But you know, have they actually acquired that and is it already tested and ready to run? Is the monthly return schedule too onerous? And this is from the perspective of saying, um, be careful trying to implement something that has very tough rules that you then relax because it's too onerous and try to get persons back to comply. I'm not saying that monthly returns may not be the solution later on, but when you're moving into something new, do I not want to give businesses the time to do it right? So I may start off as quarterly. Some have even suggested, you know, on small businesses annually or semi-annually. We spoke with colleagues in Trinidad. Their own is every two months, so there are only six submissions a year. Some businesses on an even month, some businesses on an odd month. So the government gets a steady stream of cash flow every month. And from that perspective, they're not losing out on cash flows, but it reduces the administrative burden. And that's only one example. Places like the UK, depending on your size, move to quarterly, semi-annual or annual. So again, are we trying to implement something that sounds nice, but is going to set a precedent because we're going to be relaxing it because people don't comply? And we don't have big enough jails for the number of persons who said, well, we just ain't gonna comply, right? Some are, some are defiant, some are just saying that because they refuse to, but others are saying, you know, it's gonna be a very radical difference in how we do our bookkeeping. You know, some small businesses, $100,000, is not actually that much for small businesses. You have a lot of them because that's not profit, right? That's 100,000 in gross. So that small business may still only make $20,000 a year in profit, but 100,000 is not that radical amount. So whilst they see it as being, that's going to um, omit a lot of businesses, that may not omit as many as they think. And the question is, is that the right answer anyhow? Should it be payable on unpaid invoices, right? Now this one has various experiences around the world in the sense of do I pay it even though I haven't yet collected, right? So in the service industry like ours, you know, we send bills out. Some clients are very good. I have some of those who write a check when I send the bill. I like those clients. But I have some other clients who I tell them, boy, it's amazing to consider I'm an accountant and I'm doing this work and you're not paying me because I should have been smart enough to get an upfront fee because I knew what your books looked like when I did the audit in the first place, right? <laughs> um, so I, I look at that and say, I'm not the smartest one, so I forgive them because I say, you're the idiot. Uh, but from that perspective, there can be a long delay. We do some services where it's tied up in the court system. So we have a large number of receivables, but we don't get paid for years sometimes because we're waiting on final judgments, we're waiting on release from creditors, etc. And so from that perspective, we sometimes have significant amount of receivables, but when I bill, do I have to pay VAT up front? I think persons have been a bit too dismissive from the government side and not understanding how significant this can be with businesses. Cash is king, right? I can generate a lot of profits. I was just at the um, biker seminar in terms of the conference in November and I just did it in Freeport. You know, I tell them a business can report a profit and no cash, right? They'll be quickly out of business, right? Because it may look good in terms of profit, but if it's not being monetized into money, right, then you're really not doing very well as a business. So don't underscore or don't underestimate how significant it can be to have to borrow money. And the one thing I point out to them is, I don't know any business that will take a VAT credit as credit. So you know, I have the government, you know, I, I believe on these invoices, if I don't collect, the government is gonna give me my money back. Could you take this, Mr. Bank, as collateral? Bank will say, yeah, I'll take it. Take it right to the garbage, right? Existing inventory, this is unique for some businesses, so not all. 
but what happens the inventory June 30th July 1 or whatever the implementation date is right duties were paid prior to VAT comes in this issue about uh, transitional warehouses and all of the like is a big issue that is still garnering a lot of concern by businesses that do a lot of advanced purchases in terms of whether it be for Christmas or because of where it's coming from. So persons who order from China said a lot of times they're ordering six months in advance because of the actual logistics challenges of getting goods over here. Right? So the engagement process with the government has been very good. Um, as I said, a lot of talk and a lot of meetings. What we are now looking for is that output to say meaningful output that we can demonstrate this is the result of our talk. And as I said, that has to go both ways. It has to be give and take. It can't be us providing a lot of these solutions and every single one being dismissed. That's not smart on their part because it doesn't show good faith, but equally it, it demonstrates a closed-mindedness. And if you're open-minded, then you're going to have some of the suggestions that you will welcome some of them you will be dubious about and some of them that you will very quickly dismiss but you know from that perspective it is at least a meeting of the minds and as I said if everyone is upset then we know we're okay government austerity and budget caps you know this is when they hit out on me I know anytime I talk about fiscal reform you know that's not a, a popular topic but we're trying to stress to them you can't get from 600 million to 1.8 billion and tell me you're running a lean tight ship right I'm sorry I can't accept that on the face of it yes there are certain elements you say that we can't change the only one I say you can't change is really the debt repayment the interest cost and the debt because we've already spent that money we got to pay it back but when we talk about government salaries I'm not talking about reducing the workforce from the perspective of cutting staff but I am talking about those that should be retired in any event I am talking about those that are unnecessary and not producing within the government right and we have to be very careful that the government is not seen to be an actual uh, not-for-profit organization that's giving money away. Because it's very frustrating when you have those underproductive civil servants when you're trying to conduct business. So a lot of the government ministries have excessive numbers. And everywhere you go, people will say, but yeah, when you look at that, only 30% of them are working. All right? Now that may be a harsh number. Right? But from that perspective, it is looking at cutting the waste. I believe in the budget last year, not the half year, but the full year budget last year, like as, as an example, the Ministry of Education said, well, they found five million that was being paid to people who weren't even working, right? That level of waste is one we just cannot afford. And to me, if you're telling me you don't even know who's on the payroll, right? I know when I sign our payroll, if I don't recognize that name, right? Who? They said, that's your pseudonym. I said, oh, okay, sorry, I forgot, right? So, in terms of and the budget caps maybe we are not there yet maybe they're not from a practical sense um, the best thing is you see how it, it sort of handcuffs the, the government in the US from time to time but you know what it instills discipline and it instills accountability because you have to come back and explain I always say to persons anyone who's read the government budgets in the Bahamas the most uh, uh, pages of gobbledygook that I've ever seen in my life because it makes no it has no sense to me I don't have a balance sheet, so I don't know how much I owe. I don't know what I own. I see a budget. I see a deficit. No one explained to me why. No one said, in reality, why the revenues didn't perform like they should. No one explained to me why the expenses went up more than they were expected to. But is there any recourse or accountability? Right? We just move on to the next budget. Right? And we say, well, we try better next time. WTO, IMF, IDB, Alphabet Soup. These are some guys, I mean, that's the other side. I've, I've, I've now met with these guys. I know, meeting with the IMF, I called uh, a, a colleague of mine who met with them in a different capacity. I said, what do you think? He said, well, I don't know about you, but I was ready to slit my throat when I finished that meeting. I said, well, I don't know if I was ready to slit my throat, but I was certainly ready to slit someone's throat. Right? Um, but, you know, let's bear in mind what they are and what they represent. They don't live here. They're not us, right? So they're using a textbook to say, okay, you're a country of 360,000 people. This is what the textbook says, right? This is what you should have. This is what you should do. If you don't have an alternative, then hush up and do what I say, right? So if you don't come to the table armed, then you are going to be overwhelmed because these are 
persons are very powerful. But I looked around the room and I looked at where they came from because none of them from the U.S. And I said, I don't know that your countries are actually in the best of shape either, right? And I did ask a question to the IMF. Tell me one country where your solution you've implemented and they've actually now been a success. I did get a lot of chatter, but we didn't get to any country that was highlighted. And it wasn't to embarrass them. I was being very, very candid and honest with them. But all I was asking was, okay, show me where your solution has turned it around, right? I think most countries will admit the only things that turned it around was when they themselves did it. Right? We look at Greece, we look at some of the European countries, there was a, a, a model superimposed on a lot of them, and yes, their flexibility was removed, but you know what? Nearly all of them came up with creative ways to help themselves out of the jams. They're not out of the woods yet, but they didn't stick to the piece of paper that was handed to them. WTO. This is one where we just need the information. Um, you know, I was corrected by the minister, he said, you know, you, you assume that we have a phase in time at WTO. We don't. I said, well, Minister, with all due respect, I don't think I was the only person who was under that impression. And from that perspective, if it's not phased in, then really are we kidding ourselves around what taxes we have to do? Because are you telling me that by our commitment to WTO, we don't have an alternative? No, no, I didn't say that because we don't have to ascend to WTO. So I said, well, what are the implications of not ascending? What are the benefits of ascending and doing it now? But make no mistake about it, if we were to ascend in the timeline that they projected December 2014, the end of this year, all duty rates would have to be immediately reduced to whatever they were negotiated as. I don't believe the average citizen understands that. I don't believe even the educated citizen understands that because it has all been done behind closed doors with the negotiations. And with all due respect, I don't mind the negotiations being confidential, but I do want to know the country's strategy. I do want to know why we're ascending, right? If it's only for 100 million in exports, but we have a GDP of 8.4 billion, you know, are we cutting off our noses to spite our faces, right? If it is much greater, so our imports will be hindered, sanctions, the trading partners reduced, then that has a much wider implication. And I think we are educated enough and sophisticated enough to understand the basics. We may not understand all the intricacies, but we will understand the basics. So don't hold it back from us, let us know. Be very clear, again, so I can judge whether you've made the best decision. Doesn't matter to me which administration started it and which one finished it, because obviously both administrations agree with it if they continue it. So from that perspective, at least give me the benefit of the doubt. An IDB, what these individuals have said to us is look, we're not pro or against VAT or any form of tax, we are really here at your invitation and we provide technical assistance by way of grants and loans. So if you need the grants and loans to do further studies and do other analysis, that's what we will do. They did the study when, when asked to do so by the government. So these are, none of these guys are necessarily our friends, but they're not our enemies either. We have to keep them at arm's length and we have to understand how we're working with them but if we don't have an appreciation for how we work with them, then we're probably shooting blind. So we rec made some recommendations um, that we compiled from all of the members, and what you will find is that they went far beyond VAT. You know, persons, each of the industry associations and groups came up with a listing of key concerns. Some of them were very specific to VAT, but you know, some of them were very as simple as rule of law. As a business, I really get upset if my competitor is not complying with the law, but yet he's allowed to operate. He's taking money out of, the, out of my mouth when I pay all of my taxes and he's not paying his, right? We are looking at a society where it's who you know as opposed to what you do and how you comply. And that frustrates the honest businessman. And a lot of persons say, you're asking the same people who pay taxes now to pay more for those who don't pay, right? And that's not fair. So you should be making those who don't pay, pay and then let's figure out what the tax bill has to be for everyone else, as opposed to asking those who are law-abiding to do so. We know reforms are needed across the board, so let's not just focus on tax reform, let's focus on fiscal reform. Smart spending, strategic spending, when are we spending, how are we spending, and are we getting value for money? I said to persons, use the example of the rules just as simple. Um, 
you know, we spent 200 million. Okay, we may have said we thought it should have been 100 million, but forget what we spent for a minute and say, well, if the roads are supposed to last 20 years, do our road taxes generate 10 million a year that will allow me to pay back the 200 million I borrowed? If not, are the road taxes at the appropriate level? Now, not every single department or expenditure will have such a match off, but you want to see a prime example of it is the airport. The airport was funded purely by outside investors by way of debt. If the airport doesn't make a profit and not able to pay it back, yes, the government has a certain guarantee behind it, but in reality, what was it set up to be? An autonomous, self-supporting entity. It was run by private sector individuals. So the mindset was, I will borrow now for a long-term asset that I will generate sufficient profits from to pay back that debt. So it doesn't have an expense to the government. Same thing when we talk about the roads that we have taxes for. We have other elements. We have government buildings. Nothing says if you have a government building, it has to be 100% occupied by the government. That if it can be a revenue generator by leasing office space, etc. Right? There are certain things that we know we can't do because the Defense Force boats, whether we like them or not, you know, there's no revenue from it unless we sell the crawfish and the drugs and the <laughs> you, well, no, let's not go that far, but unless we sell what we capture, right? So there's no real revenue coming back from that one, so we have to appreciate that there's a transfer from other revenues where we're making profits, etc. But in reality, we need to be looking at are we getting value for money, and it's not this year. And that's why our system of accounting for government expenditure is deficient and archaic, because we have nothing that says what are our assets, how long are they lasting, and what's the cost to us each year of maintaining them. So what were the Paramount Act factors for fiscal reform? So we talked about, you know, everyone would say, well, why was the first thing the accounting thing? Financial reporting systems, right? We need decent information. Do you know any business that makes information off of bad information? I tell them, I grew up just around the corner um, in Dallasville Street with Roberts, a uh, little tuck shop on the corner. And even though they were only writing in the ledger, and the money I don't know is in the pocket or the till, but I know they were guarding both of them because they were standing by the door. Um, from that perspective, they made their decision over what they bought, what they sold, on what profits they were making, whether they were making money. But they did that only having decent information, and it doesn't mean having an elaborate system. It means having a system that at least allows me to analyze my assets, my obligations, where my monies are coming in, and what I'm spending. We have a system now that's just simply saying, this is money coming in, money going out. But as I said, has anyone listened to debate when it used to be back in the day, well, um, you know, Mr. Speaker, line 156 is saying $30,000, I believe it should be 15. I don't know what one line 156 was and it really don't make a difference to me. We don't have segment information. We don't know, I asked, how much does it run to, to how much does it cost to run a family island? They were candid, they said, we don't know. Right? Because we don't know if the police who we said were stationed down there were really there. We don't know what expenditure we have. So how do we know? Right? Is Grand Bahama contributing its fair share? We always say there's the argument from the Port Authority and their businesses that they are contributing so much. But how much are we spending? How much are the concessions being given to the hotels to keep that economy alive? How much are the other things the government is, is, is expending in there? And it's not to say by any means that we're cutting them, but how do we know? Our financial reporting system is just so deficient. Budget caps, you know, establish and agree them and approve them and manage them, and, but the big thing is be accountable for breaching them. You know, a budget in a real life business is a very serious thing because when you, when you reach the first quarter and you're exceeding budget, what do you start to do? You start to revisit your business model. You start to revisit how you're expending. You say, am I going to continue down the same path? If I'm not generating the revenues, you start to look at your expenses. How do I cut my expenses? So we need to have it where we agree these and there's accountability by explaining what it was we got wrong and how do we fix it. But if we don't do that, then we're just going to repeat ourselves, right? A self-perpetuating cycle. Oh, sorry. And only increase it by an act of um, parliament. Information and transparency. So there's a lot of talk about what information is available. So it's getting it out there. The Freedom of Information Act, you know, was originally already drafted and, and ready. So is that the one? I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. Is, are there flaws in it? Possibly, but it will get us at least starting. So information will be out in the public domain. We start to have greater appreciation 
for what's been happening so far behind closed doors. Recurrent revenue, collect what is due, right? That's a very big message. Manage to the budget and let it be auditable and reconcilable. The Auditor General's reports, I think, are still on 2011 or 12, I think 12, um, in terms of being tabled. Um, I'm being advised 11, right? <laughs> but from that perspective, we're three years behind. And so how many times, though, are those findings or those results acted upon? Because how many times do you hear a table in the House where the Auditor General is, is expressing concern about fraud, lost monies, um, inability to account for funds, inability to demonstrate where monies were spent, you know, right down to NEMA and others, right? There's a big issue where we have a function that is supposed to be designed to hold people accountable for what's being spent, but yet there's no action on the findings. Try and move away from this cash system, right? Why do we have fraud in customs collections? Because you're still collecting cash, right? The automated um, filings for things coming in. I mean, at the airport, I think you're always going to find that difficulty because no matter how many bags they got, that's three hundred dollars. Or if they have six children with them, that's eighteen hundred dollars. But I mean, whatever it is, we need to spend more than the people we carried, right? Um, so you're going to have a difficult time with that. But you have the cash system, and the cash system promotes fraud. I told them, um, and I was at Rotary a couple of weeks ago, when I was in Canada, and that's, you know, in, in the late 90s, um, even then I was carrying around a debit card. There was no way I was using cash. When I lived in Europe, there was no way I was using cash. When I came back to the Bahamas, my friends said, put cash in your wallet, because when they rob you, if you don't have some money, you can get shot. So I have to put a couple of dollars there. But in reality, I don't, I, I'm in a habit of not having cash on me, simply because it, 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 well, firstly, it bulks up the wallet unnecessarily because it's all dollar bills on my case. It's never the big bills. But secondly, it's, it's simpler to swipe a card. And you know what it does? It gives me accountability because I can see the statement. And then I say, I spend money on what? Right? And I could ask my wife the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Revenue from disposal of assets and leases. Personally, I have a fundamental belief that the government should not be selling our prime asset in land. You don't regurgitate land, right? You don't recreate it. I mean, uh, in Dubai, they did create the palm by, you know, dredging the ocean and creating the land. But, you know, in general, you don't have that. You don't, you don't create land. So, you know, in reality, serious investors who are coming with money that don't need the land to be pledged to actually support their borrowing that they're going to use to put in your country, right? Don't mind if it's leased for 100 years. You know, I was in the UK, I lived in the Barbican, and I was looking at the apartment I was in, and I asked the landlady, you know, could I get, um, you know, could I buy it? So she said yes, and we started talking, and she said, but, you know, it's a lease, you don't have a uh, free and simple title to it. So I said, lease? She said, my dear, is 99 years. If you're still here in 99 years, you worry about it then, <laughs> right? But you probably ain't gonna be here, right? So in reality, you know, you find in New York City, there's very little that is actually transferred. The land doesn't move. But when we do sell our capital assets, then we should not be using that for a current expenditure. We should be ensuring that those monies go to pay off our debt. Because that money was not money we were banking on from recurrent uh, revenues. So if that's an exceptional gain, then that should be used to exceptionally pay off our debt. Right? And we have to stick by that. And it, it doesn't mean paying off the debt today, but borrowing the same amount of money tomorrow to say, well, I paid off the debt, but yeah, but you borrowed the same amount of money. It really should be still living within your means and any gains you put towards it, right? No different than when you have a mortgage and you get a bonus. If you want to pay off your mortgage faster, what do you do? Excess money that you don't need in your regular budget, you put towards the, the mortgage, right? Or your credit card bill or whatever bill it is so that you reduce your interest costs, you reduce your finance costs. Right? So from that perspective, really thinking about disposal of assets and lease. Social programs, I mean, we keep talking about them, but do we look at their efficiency and how effective they are? Because are we just throwing bad money after bad money? Right? Are we really looking at, are the programs working? How are we benchmarking? Are they reaching the people who they intended to reach? Are they benefiting the individuals who we intend them to benefit? And really, are they costing us, when we look at the cost-benefit relationship, is it worth the effort? 
There's a big difference between teaching a man to fish and giving him a fish, right? So those monies be deployed in terms of helping the individual self-sustain themselves. Or should we be giving them a handout? Because you create the handout, what do you create? A dependent society. Now unfortunately, for politicians, they like that because a dependent society means the individuals have to come back to me because they depend on me. But it doesn't do much for our progress and development. So we really need to think about efficiency benchmarks. Recurrent expenditure, top-down responsibility for, for, for the budget. You know, it, 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 to me, just I can't conceive how you say you go to all of the departments and tell me what money you need, and then that forms my budget, right? Because in a business, it sort of says, this is the money you have, and tell me how you're going to spend it, right? I, as a summer student, worked in government. You know what they said? Well, we spend all the budget. The reason being is so that next year no one questions and we ask for the same amount or more. So even if we have surpluses, we don't recognize it because you know we're on a cash system. Because if we do that, you know what? They may not give me more. So at least if I spend all that I have, I at least get that back. So if we don't get this thing right from the beginning in terms of saying top down, what can I afford to spend and how is the why spending? Capital expenditure, a proper program. Even the roadworks was really haphazard. We knew we needed it for how many years? And I was like, okay, now's a good time because we have a recession, we need to plow money into the economy. But do we have a, a structured capital replacement program looking at our current infrastructure? How many government buildings have fallen down? Largely due to disrepair, lack of maintenance, and all of the other challenges that could have prevented it. But we know that there's an infrastructure problem that has to be fixed in the not too distant future. When we look at the systems that are being run by government, I keep hoping that there's a green light shining in the back and not a green screen, because I, have, I haven't seen green screens since I was in high school, right? But some of our government systems are still on these old DOS programs, et cetera. So we know there's significant um, expenditure to come about, but we have to start the transparency in the bidding projects um, process. Who is winning the bids? Who is submitting? Who is really the qualified? And it doesn't always mean that the lowest bid is the best one. That's a plug for PwC may not come in as the lowest bid, right? But we are the best one. So from that perspective though, it is saying how do we judge? So how do we match up, right? Compare apples with apples and oranges with oranges, right? So a person whose company has just been formed and has five people working for it versus an established company that's been around for many years and has a track record, they're not gonna be ranked the same, right? So we need to have transparency in the process and then we need to hold persons accountable. So if we've awarded a contract to you, uh, it's amazed me at every contract that you hear go to parliament to be awarded and it has a 5% contingency um, built into it, right? And maybe that's from a practical standpoint so they don't have to come back to parliament. But you know what, if you tell a contract you have a 5% contingency, that tells me I have 5% more I can charge, right? As opposed to saying you quoted $10 million you come in, if you exceed that, we will talk about how we look for the differences. And if it's my fault, fair enough, because I had design changes or anything else, whatever service or, or product it is I'm acquiring. But don't give that up front, right? It has to be holding persons accountable. The modeling I spoke about, so we want to establish tools that we can use going forward. So look at the impact on the economy. We, not, not just this exercise now, but others as well. Productivity. This is one you don't like, the government and civil service um, doesn't like to hear, but it's really saying getting out of them what I'm paying them for, right? I, my, my, my constant um, gripe is this, I'm not asking you to do me a favor, right? Because I'm paying your salary by the fact that I'm paying taxes. So don't look down on me with disdain when I ask you to stop drinking your tea to get me what I ask for, right? It is that I'm paying for it. So I should be able to demand productivity. In the private sector, if you don't produce, right, you don't work. You know, I was in Cayman, there was a, um, was a director, he's a Caymanian, he's a director at Credit Suisse. He said, you know, the way the world is now with my iPod, I could sit on my boat and do my work. He said, but if I don't do my work, I could sit on the boat, but it ain't gonna be working for Credit Suisse, right? It'll be someone else sitting on that same boat with that same iPod doing the work and I probably paying for the fuel, but it ain't gonna be me working for Credit Suisse, right? And it was, I, I smiled when I heard it because I said, I wish people understood that, that in private sector, you don't produce, you don't work. So in the public sector, this concept that I can't get rid of you for lack of productivity 
or efficiency is one that has to go. An advisory board, we believe that there has to be a constant link between the private and public sector, right? Because that's the only way things are going to work. It doesn't mean you always agree, but at least it has a constant flow of information between the two sectors. An ombudsman, you know, independent monitoring. And I did see a recent article in terms of saying that a lot of countries that have set it up but is ineffective because it doesn't work, or they don't have any teeth, or they don't have any power. But it is looking at the whistleblower, you know, in terms of you'll be amazed at how many compliant businesses would blow on a non-compliant business because as I said a business that's not competing fairly not paying their fair share of taxes and not paying their fair share of expenses is actually uh, unfavorable to me because it's probably putting me out of business because they're able to charge lower prices not because of true competition but because they're cheating on the taxes so you'd be amazed at how many persons would tell and in the Bahamas society if it's anonymous the only thing is being a trust no anonymity because everyone will say well who's this now that sounds like your voice. You talking on someone? No, sir. <laughs> right? And then you hang up because people pick up voices. But I think with an, an anonymous system, we would have a great, uh, much more. Encourage and cooperate because we're saying the high level discussions need to be had on a regular basis. And that goes back to the advisory board. And there are so many things impacting our country. And we have to all now, it's a call to arms. This is the time when we have to contribute. It's not to say, create too many cooks in the kitchen because they may spoil the broth but those who have a voice to add add the voice and it's how you do so because we can marshal all those voices into concentrated echoes and those echoes build and they become louder and louder and you know what they resonate because those voices represent the people who have to do the votes and so from a politician standpoint the louder those voices are the more they listen because they have to respect them we have to be mindful that we don't live in our own little world. Most beautiful country in the world. Anyone who's traveled and come back home will say that. Right? I live in the Bahamas, I don't jump in the ocean, but when I'm not away, when I'm not here, I miss those beautiful beaches. You know, that's the one thing you cry at night at, you saying that this River Thames don't look nothing like Exuma. <laughs> right? But we have to be competitive because we have to be ready to compete with others. It's amazing how any student that does well at COB and goes abroad, I always hear about them being top students away. And when we leave, it's almost like a chip on our shoulder, right? I've been called a little island boy, or the boy from the island in university when I work abroad. But you know what we love? We love to show up the big countrymen. So yeah, we're from the little island, but you'll be surprised at all this small axe and cut down a big tree, right? But yet, when we come back home, now, I don't want no international people competing with me. This must be a protectionist society. I don't want international lawyers. I don't want doctors from Cuba. I don't want persons in the labor force that is going to compete. And we have to be careful with that because we live in a global arena. Ease of doing business. You know, most businesses will tell you their biggest gripe is just how difficult it is to get a permit, how difficult it is to pay the taxes. I don't mind paying it, but I mean, it's a headache. I go down to the business license division, I stand in on lines. I can't do it online. Everything else I could go into my bank account and wire the funds. I can do it online, right? I can pick up a phone. I can do it from the bank. On government, I have to go still stand in line, still pay homage to the person behind the desk because even though they're only a cashier, they're the most powerful person in civil society <laughs> when I go there because if I open my mouth, They'll close the window, and that'll be half hour before they open it back up, right? But frustration. E-government, we keep hearing about it, and when do we get there, you know? How do we get there faster? Although I was impressed. I did do my license online, my driver's license. I tried it. It didn't work, because when I got there, they still had to print it when I got there. But what I was happy for, I didn't have to stand in line. I didn't have to wait. I came in with my receipt. I said, has it been printed? The lady looked at me. I don't even know if she looked to see if it was printed, to be honest. Uh, I don't think so, but sit over there. But within two minutes, I had my driver's license, I was walking out, so I was quite impressed. Like I said, I don't know, it could be two driver's licenses there, right? Productivity, we go back to it, making sure that we are productive as a nation. Education and workforce development. Kersna, um had an opportunity to speak with them when they were doing phase three, and it, it was disheartening because they said they interviewed nearly 10,000 people in order to hire 1,000, right? 
in terms of going through resumes, in terms of going through um, capabilities, skill sets, and just having basic, you know, three R's, right? Reading, writing, and arithmetic, right? The problem is when you're teaching them three R's and none of them have R's except one, is a problem too. But we have a society where we're not producing the individuals to take on the jobs that we want to have. You can't preach about white collar jobs or you can't preach about high end jobs if you're not training your workforce to take them over. But we also, it's a fallacy believing that the only high paying jobs are these white collar jobs. A quality plumber, mason, or carpenter will probably make far more than I would because people will be willing to pay whatever just to have a clean, timely, efficient service to get in and out. I know when the plumber comes and all he does is tighten a screw, that's $75. Not even me is getting $75 for 10 minutes. Right? And that frustrates me. I tell him I sit down and have a cup of coffee or something. You need to talk to me because for $75, <laughs> we, we got to get to know one another better because I, I just can't give my money away like that. Right? <laughs> Collect what is due. We keep repeating that. Right? Property taxes, customs, business license fees. Payroll tax. The only thing with payroll tax, and we've, you know, we've said this, and I've, I've said to the ministry, be very careful about being disingenuous about what the coalition offered. Because when we were talking about what was the gap, the gap was VAT was going to incrementally earn us $200 million. So from that perspective, that wasn't factoring in a change in customs duties, but it was saying we need to have something immediate that allows us to get additional revenue that gives us time to structure a long-term tax and fiscal reform. The last few days and last week, speaking with tax attorneys and tax accountants, they've spoken about some of the newer societies where it's been a lot more innovative in what they've been doing, but these were years in the making. And they had short-term, medium-term, and long-term goals where they wanted to be. So from the coalition's perspective, payroll tax was no more than saying this is something because it's already available in national insurance, allowed a quick collection. Was it perfect? Everyone jump up, you know, what about people who are not on the payroll? What about people who are business owners? What about this? What about the next thing that's um, the flaws? You know, VAT isn't perfect either, right? Income tax is imperfect. None of the solutions is 100% compliant. So this was an element of saying, get us through, if you will, the rainy day so that we can look to brighter days but with a comprehensive plan, not a very short-term plan about how do I achieve something by 2017. So it was recommended in the initial stages, employer only. I know my Bahamian society. When we don't like VAT, yes, the employer will pay all. If there's a chance of VAT being shelled for this, now I don't know about paying all. I'm willing to pay some. Right? But the employee needs to pay some as well. But in reality, however it's structured, 5% based on what we're seeing as the current payroll in the Bahamas, based on GDP and statistics as available, would have gotten us close to 190 million. All right? But that was with no changes to customs duties and the other taxes. So again, this was a new tax being introduced, but it was not the panacea, it was not the solution to VAT. Easier to administer and only the employed would pay. Tax on business profits, we really have to think about business, the business license fee. In particular this year when they had changes in business license fees, it's, it's um, unbelievable how many businesses have said to me, you know, we are profitable pre-business license fees and we are break even or at a loss once we accrue for our business license fee. And a, a tax cannot put businesses into the red. There's no tax the world over, whether it be corporate tax, income tax, that says when you make a loss, you pay taxes. So it cannot be a situation where the taxes are so high that it makes you have a loss. Because the taxes really have to be commensurate with the level of earnings. And this system that we have where we're doing it on gross revenues, particularly for small margin businesses, is a killer. Right? And this is one we really have to revisit. So should we be, would it collect more if it was on profits? The answer is probably not. But if you increase the rate, would business be willing to pay it because it would only be when they generated a profit as opposed to a penalty of regardless of whether they're profitable, they pay business license fees. All right? These were some smaller ones, capital gains on foreign owned real estate. 
in terms of saying, you know, persons buy, and especially when we had the big boom in the land, buying it at a million, selling the three, all of that profit leaves the country, right? Lower lending rates, we're in a pegged economy, right, with the, the currency on the dollar. So there's, there's, there's a limited flexibility in what we can do with interest <coughs> rates, but are they at the rates that they can be in terms of stimulating activity? Possibly not. Cruise passenger taxes, you talk to the hotel association, they can't stand the cruise ships. I don't think the cruise ships like them either. Um, but they say that the cruise ships tend to seem to get away with a, a much better deal. Now, I did see some argument over that where the cruise ships didn't agree with that. But you know what they say about facts, they can be twisted to suit anyone. Airspace and overflight fees, that comes with an e expense because we have to be able to administer it and we have to be able to regulate it and, and, and operate the airspace. Shipping lane fees, you know, because Grand Bahama is the shipping um, capital and the transshipment point simply because of the shipping lanes that the Bahamas has, but we don't collect any revenues for use of it. Panama does, right? Someone just not too far from us. Existing rates on automobiles, I had to throw it in for Rick because he was here. I don't know if he really said it, but I mean, that sounds like a good thing. Web shops and number houses, I am by no means uh, saying what should be done, but it is an informal part of the economy that's not contributing. So in some form or fashion, it has to. If it's closed down, is that practical and can it be done? I don't know. But if it's closed down, that money goes elsewhere. So it goes into the formal economy. If it's taxed, regulated and taxed, then you have money coming into the economy as well. So you have to think about this. Yes, I'm not standing at odds with the Christian Council, right? Uh, we, we, you don't ever do that in the Bahamas. But I am saying that we have to look at the informal economy and try to close those, right? Not too long ago, bootlegging was, you know, not legal. Now, you know, every liquor store next to every church. So what's next for the chamber and the coalition? And some of this we've always, uh, already done. Advising the private sector and the government. But what you find, you're seeing some of the PR campaign from us, some of these talks in terms of educating on what we've been doing, what VAT is, what we should be thinking about. Uh, we're looking at how do we move our campaign now from the focus on VAT to wider fiscal reform and what we have to focus on. We have the economic modeling going on. That's well in tow. We've gotten the data from the government, all that exists. We will have the results the end of April, early May. But that's not the end of the story because we're also going to be in a situation of having to put forward the alternatives and recommendations based on the empirical data that's coming back to us. So we are doing quite a lot, right? It's pro bono for those that are there. So the time spent is one that it is a civic contribution, but I think Everyone that has been a part of it is of the view that we have to get it right for the Bahamas. And so if we get it right, we will benefit from it at the end of the day. I'm thinking it's going to be very much like you know, past presidents, that at least if I get it right, then PwC will be the firm of choice, because Gowan was a part of the coalition, so I could get book deals and some revenues on the other side. So that brings it to end. I see a hand at the back. Okay. This fine gentleman beside me, and it's something I, I hope that the coalition will take in the future, is what are we going to do eventually if we ever find oil and the revenues from oil, and the fact that we should be putting it towards reducing our debt as opposed to going pissing it away. And that's something I hope this that you could take back to that group. Because mm -hmm. I'm also on the, on the board of the chamber. Um, from well aware of what you guys are doing. My other um, concern, though, is we keep hearing in the paper, and you see it, with the Minister of State for Finance saying, all the other alternatives are foolish and for bringing it back. So when you see that, you get very discouraged about what all of us as private business are trying to do. Mm -hmm. And, and it, you know, they're it, so negative, you're wondering, are you really trying, are, is there hope that you're making a difference? And that's what I would like you to ask. Right. The, how do I answer that without getting myself in trouble, because I see NB12. <laughs> <laughs> um, the very statement that you make is one of the feedback points that we've been saying to the ministry and the persons who've been speaking. 
that when you have it as combative and being very dismissive of any other alternative, it does two things. It, it creates the, um, discourages persons to say, well, you know, is there something better? But I would say equally, it actually feigns ignorance because you're saying it from a position of sentiment as opposed to empirical analysis. That if you were able from the very beginning to demonstrate that the others from an impact to the economy, to GDP and growth, to jobs, quality of earnings, that VAT was superior because when you compared it to the others, it came out as superior, you wouldn't have even had this debate about alternatives. The fact that you've not yet done that analysis says that it should be done. And we've taken up that mantle and not free. It is costing us with the Oxford economics. It is costing us considerably. We had to raise funds in order to do so. In the beginning, it was touch and go. We went out to an RFP without the money. Um, we started looking at the economists. And you know what? Person saw what we were doing. And you'd be surprised at how many people came and dedicated the money specifically to them. In the discussions between ourselves and government officials, in our meetings, it is very positive in that the Prime Minister has said very clearly to us that he is open to hearing the alternatives. And for him, he does not want to put on the backs of the Bahamian people something they cannot bear. And he was very clear in that regard that the July date is one that if they're not ready, will not happen. And we leave the meeting feeling very exuberant because we feel that that's a positive message. And then we see comments in the press to the contrary. And sometimes that's confusing for us even as well. Um, the problem we have is that how do you respond? Because um, persons get very thin skin when we say things aggressively or are combative in that statement. And to be honest, if there was greater maturity where it wasn't taken as a personal attack, because in reality, none of this is an attack on any of the individuals. This is on the concept and the actual government's plan that we are, we, are, we are fostering. And from that perspective, we are trying as best we can to temper their message by staying very much on point with the facts and circumstances and what we are doing. Um, I would say that it is having success from the perspective that a number of persons in the community say to me, I appreciate what you guys are doing. It's not an easy task, but we believe that you're making a difference regardless of how they um, bolster their chests and speak out. So I believe we are getting there. Do I believe we have convinced them of anything yet? No. Um, but equally, I don't think they've been able to convince us by the data and the analysis that they've had. Um, what we are looking at is not a rebellion against the government. It is saying that the citizens wake up and now demand facts, alternatives, and a proper timeline for implementation. And that's what we focused our attention on. Thank you. All right. I certainly admire all the research and work that your coalition has put into it, and I appreciate your general statement of the future. But it seems to me that you've got to choose between two kind of alternative and maybe conflicting strategies right now. Is your strategy basically going to be to accept that VAT is inevitable and you're going to work with the government to, and the private sector to make it as smooth and painless <coughs> as possible? Or is your general strategy going to be to convince government that VAT is not the way to go and to make you think much more of the various alternatives that you've mentioned here tonight? Okay. And that, that's. Um I would probably say I don't necessarily agree that we have to make that strategy choice today, but we will in the very near future. Um, and why I say that is this, that we have never come out as anti-VAT. We have said that we want sufficient evidence to demonstrate that this in comparison to other alternatives is superior. Um, with that being said, we feel it prudent that you have to be mindful that if VAT comes out from the economic modeling as the best alternative on the table right now given the structure that we have to, to implement, right? Then we would have to get behind the government in terms of helping them get over the implementation challenges and the uh, inherent 
um, contradictions in the legislation, regulations, etc., to get it to where it should be, but we believe that needs time and it can't be done with July. If the economic modeling comes back and says that there is an alternative that does less damage to the economy and allows for a greater recovery of the economy, then we will be opposed to VAT because you will have dynamic evidence that supports that going forward. So I totally agree with you that there is going to be a choice of picking the lane very shortly. Um, at this point in time, we have stayed objective and said we will let the facts determine what our decision is. But equally, given that VAT is on the table as it currently stands, we will look at the implementation challenges. What I also say, and, and this is one not so much from the coalition directly, but, but personally, fighting a government is a very difficult task because they have the ability to tax you to fight you back. <laughs> right? So from our perspective in terms of saying the funding of fighting a government is not a notion that is easily digested. I think what is more important is influencing a government. And in a small island nation, as sad as it may seem, most politicians' point of view is five years out. But we've already used up two, right? So from that perspective, if you get the support of the citizens without creating hysteria, without creating panic, because you don't want a tide that you can't turn back, and you get them behind you, then their comments to their MPs, their comments to their representatives, are going to have persons stop and ponder. I think it's, it's safe to say that the reason that VAT has not been spoken about by most of the MPs is because the, the comments and sentiments they've gotten back from their constituents is not very much in favor of it. And they themselves don't have sufficient information to convince them otherwise, <laughs> all right? So you sort of fight the battle you have, right? With the ammunition you have, and, and that's not um, conceding anything, not saying um, deploy your resources to where you get the biggest bang for the buck. Excuse me, I'd like to ask you, one of the points that I've been sort of trying to push on this bat, uh, in particular, if it comes in, why are we going to have necessarily such high rates to start with, which we know is going to create social uh, problems, and it's going to have a network to catch it. If you reduce the rates, and there's no reason, in my opinion, why there should be different rates to different industries. It doesn't have to be one flat rate right across it. And I don't know if that's an approach that you ever considered or yeah. ask the government about or yep. whatever. Yeah, and part of the um, economic modeling, the baseline was the 15%, but the other um, rates coming down to look at what those impacts on the economy would be as well. So a 10%, an 8%, and exactly as you said, one rate across the board, so no differences between the hotel industry and the rest of the economy. Um, the hotel sector um, expresses very clearly that everywhere else in the world, um, hotels tend to get a preferential rate because they are exporting. And in most systems outside of tourism, export is zero rated. So you sort of have this concept of having the export consumed in country. So you have a, a, a dichotomy there. However, going back to the other one in terms of considering the rates and why it was 15%, it's becoming clear why they originally went at 15% because when you look at the WTO ascension, the level of customs duties uh, reductions that are going to be required as a part of that ascension, there's going to be a revenue loss of about 300 million in customs duties. And so when they looked at the VAT rate originally, with that in mind, it is clear to see that they were really intending VAT to be a replacement of customs duties. So I ascend to WTO by reducing the, the customs rates, but I implement another form of consumption tax that would compensate for that same amount of lost revenue from customs duties, and then I broaden the tax base by taxing the service economy. With them scaling back, whether it will be 15%, 10%, or another rate, what we are looking at that is going to be factored in is what are the WTO level rates, because we either need to convince them that WTO ascension right now is not the answer because we need to work through sort of other issues internally before we decide to take that big step or else 
we're going to have to have a higher VAT rate for it to even be meaningful because customs duties come, out, come down so low and the government loses that much revenue, then they will be in a worse state than they are today. Yeah, thank you. I just had this one. I come to you, John. Yeah. Yep. We've asked that question, so that's the best way I can ask that to you. And we've said, don't give me a 100,000 page document on a one page, say to me, what was the government strategy and why did it feel the need for WTO ascension, right? I think ultimately um, the golden rule, he who has the goal makes the rule. Um, so the big countries will um, force smaller territories into it unless they have a very unique sustainable model that, that doesn't require uh, interplay with other um, global economies. But from that perspective, is there a reason for it right now for us? I don't have the answer for that and we've asked uh, the Minister of Financial Services, Ryan, for that answer. Yeah. Rick, you could answer that one. I didn't even take it out. <laughs> one of the areas that's always interests me is, and is the figure correct I heard, on customs duties we seem to only collect 50% or less than Less than that. Yeah. After being in business for many years, we never got our goods before the duty was paid. Mm -hmm. Are there a group or people who are able to get around that? So that too, of that percentage? What, what we've raised with the IMF on that front is when they make that projection, what are the component parts of that? Um, I think there are a couple of issues that, that has come clear when we speak with them. One is this um, what is re invoicing um, that they found. So, persons buying goods abroad, setting up um, their own inventory company in the US or wherever it is, and re invoicing at a lower rate. So, paying customs duties on a lower rate of goods, and I guess <coughs> take the risk of insuring it at the lower rate when they put it on the manifest coming in. That um, that, that's one. The second one is. Um, the fraud within the customs department where there are a whole bunch of goods that come in in a 40-foot container. The first 20 feet is dutiable. The other 20 feet is a secret compartment that has everything else behind it. Um, but the fraud in terms of collusion with the customs officer allows that to come into society with a leakage. You see it, um, their view is on uh, the cigarettes as an example and that's why they, they moved to the excise stamp now to say that it, it has to be marked to show that the customs duties have been paid. Apparently in the liquor industry as well, sort of some of the American and Canadian beers are being brought in in the backs of cars, in the backs of trailers. So another side of it, um, the level at the airport that I buy, you know, apparently it's not sort of the regular items in terms of clothing and, and toiletries and, and electronics but jewelry, uh, millions of dollars in diamonds and um, gold and other things are being brought in. But because they are small, they're coming in in hand luggage and so getting through. So in terms of the 50%, I don't think that one is driven largely by a receivable that is not being collected. So persons are able to clear goods without paying customs duties. It is more the other avenues where the proper duty rate is not being applied. However, there is the challenge of the customs bond where they do have elements of, of customs duties um, racking up as receivables and having some problems but that's not the primary contributor as far as we've been advised. We have also asked for in addition to the IMF um, the information that was given to the IMF in order to come up with that statistic that they came up with the internal government's own analysis of the collection rates on the various taxes, so not only customs, excise, real property, but on business license, on bank fees, on um, the auxiliary fees, road tax or road traffic tax. So we've asked them for an overall compliance rate because if we look at the compliance rate and we can get that up, so I spend the resources, if I'm under 50%, there's a tremendous amount that's being left on the table, right? If I move that 5%, if I move it 10%, Right? How much more do I collect? Um, and is there really a huge cost to that? Because some of that may be, whether it's outsourcing to the private sector, 
um, which is more efficient at doing this, or if it's demanding greater accountability in-house through various programs, incentives, etc., that if they're able to collect it. I think, you know, what was really um, an odd thing to say is that on the real property tax, the amnesty in that regard was given to those who didn't pay, <laughs> right? So if you hadn't paid, you came in. You understood the element of sort of, I guess it was like the gun amnesty. If I don't arrest you for bringing in a gun, you may have the incentive to bring the gun in. So I collect more by having the property registered, if I, even if I give away the old um, taxes. But in reality, when you're talking about 590 million uncollected, you really couldn't afford to give away taxes. Johnny. Yeah, very good Thanks, Johnny. Um, given what you know, Not dismissed, but I, know, I, I saw you there, so that's why I didn't want to get too excited by bringing it down to 1%, because I know how you think. <laughs> rely on Johnny to give me a bucket now. I got to write these down and go. First one, on, in terms of where we are in three years, I think that um, we're not to use a cliche at a crossroads, but I think that right now the path we decide upon in the next six months is going to have long-range uh, effects what happens later. When I say that, that's not to say that VAT would cure it or payroll tax or anything else. I think though, if we don't demonstrate a serious commitment to fiscal reform and things like you mentioned in terms of procurement and how we improve that significantly, collection, and seriously look at our fiscal trajectory, then I think in three years time, yes, we will be in um, what up to our next. Um, and what I say to persons, we don't have to look too far and we have Jamaica, an hour's flight from us, Haiti, an hour and a half from us, how bad things can be. And to be honest, once you get there, that hole is so deep that getting out of it or climbing out of it is an impossible task. Um, on the banking, financial services, and tourism, if I use those as an example, the banking sector is contracting. The amount of money in the banking, se banking sector is not contracting, but the number of players will because the regulation taxation in foreign jurisdictions is becoming so onerous that the attractiveness of an offshore um, subsidiary is shrinking. So our private banks are under threat and they will say that. Our retail banks, the Bahamas is still by far their largest profit center of any of the Caribbean um, islands in that regard. So I don't think you'll see like you had in Jamaica where uh, major Canadian banks are pulling out and I think that would be there but given that their retained earnings or their equity is what is the large part of our reserves that is on unstable ground because if there is a call for their reserves to come back into their home territories we're going to have a significant impact on our reserves. On the interest rates and, and, and the, the reserve I think 
there's um, schools of thought and you can debate them. I think the key element is with a currency peg, the currency peg is generally managed by interest rates. Um, we don't trade our currency because it's not a situation where we are looking for the demand of the Bahamian dollar to keep the currency pegged. Our currency peg is by the reserves we keep in. Um, there may be an argument over the outflows of currency if you change interest rates, but the concept of arbitrage when talking with economists is a big topic. And as I said, I, don't, I won't say that interest rates where they are have to be where they are, but I do say that it, it, you have to have, be very careful with the argument that we don't have the flexibility like a US, a UK, Europe to use the interest rate in monetary policy like those countries do because generally monetary policy picks up for fiscal policy. We've defined the monetary policy by pegging the currency, so we have to be careful. But I do believe we have to be mindful of how we reduce certain government costs. Um, from that perspective though, I think when we start looking government debt, pension plans and others, what we have to be careful of is addressing what I would call the root as opposed to treating the symptom. And to me, if I get the government into the habit of saying, well, by reducing the artificial prime rate, and I'll call it artificial because it's not really determined by market forces, if I reduce the artificial prime rate, am I printing money for them effectively by giving them an easy way out? Because they are seeing that now as I reduce my internal government debt, but in reality on the external market, if they have to bolster reserves or they have to borrow money outside of the Bahamas, that interest rate is radically different. So I think we have to be careful how we manage them. But I think the three things that we have as a country have to do. A national economic plan and not lip service. That economic plan has to be comprehensive in terms of what we want our identity to be as a country and what industries and how we forge them, we go forward. I admire places like Cayman, Bermuda, not so much because of their dynamic but they've been very clear as what they wanted to be. Cayman wants to be a hedge fund jurisdiction. Everything they do, immigration policy, taxation policy, um, how businesses are structured, how Caymanians are hired, is geared around protecting that industry. Change in legislation in the US could pull it all away, but it's not gonna be for lack of effort from Cayman. Bermuda is very much, we gave them their um, offshore insurance industry simply because we introduced a premium tax, but didn't realize that there's a difference between domestic insurance and international insurance, and that left. Now, Bermuda charges the premium tax, but that's not coming back. We've lived off of the Stafford Sands model of financial services and tourism, but we've not had an evolution or even a rethink about those two elements in terms of where the world has moved to. Private banking no longer exists. Wealth management exists now. Very different. When you see Switzerland gives up the ghost, then you give up the ghost too, right? Because Switzerland was a small territory but very powerful because it had so much of the world's wealth of those persons who were hiding the funds. The European Union countries and OECD countries have been able to apply so much pressure that in Switzerland bank secrecy is taboo now as well. And we have to say, well, is this tax haven status the best thing for us? I know when you say to Bahamians, income tax, corporate tax, or any type of taxation that goes directly to your pocket, there is a shudder um, because of fear. But every, when we look at how we move, if we determine our own fate, we will be far better off than allowing us, our fate to be determined by outside forces because we've borrowed ourselves into oblivion and now we have to answer to the piper. So I know that's a long answer and it tries to um, compartmentalize each one of the ones you said, but I think that citizens like yourself, like myself, like Rick and others, we have different views, we have sometimes opposing views, but I think if we are not vocal, if we are not contributing, and we are not making our voices be heard, then we are doing a disservice to the others who don't have the same skill set and background, and now it may come at a personal sacrifice, I know it does to me, but I think it's, the time is now that we have to get something right. And the only way we do that is by all of us contributing and forcing the powers that be to listen. As I said, if you get the high school students, 
you get the college students at COB, you get the average citizen who's afraid of where we're going. They're not the ones who are necessarily going to come up with the ideas, but they're the ones who are going to go home and say, we need to support these guys. And I think most persons would have been surprised if you said the coalition to even get 10,000 um, persons signed up to the actual petition. You know, okay, 10,000 out of 300,000, you may say it's not a radical number, but when you look at other petitions to get to 1,000 is a difficult one. And you know what it is? It's like a snowball effect. That as people understand and see the, the, the petition and what is behind it, then you find that that number could be 60,000 before you know it, not because of anything new, but because a person's now becoming greater aware. So that's why I've done it in, in terms of my personal side. It, it comes at a sacrifice to my own business activities. Um, but I believe that the general populace appreciates it and they stand behind it. And if you give them something to fight with you with, they will do so. And I think you have the average citizen speaking out a lot more than they ever have before. Okay, I got two more questions. I'll take one with Mike and one more afterwards. Um, have you considered the, the uh, possible effect of the back, proposed back tax on government contracts? Obviously, it's 58%, uh, it's a hell of a lot different than, that. say, 5%. But government has enormous numbers of contracts in the year. Mm -hmm. Is that then considered? And also, the um, possibility of a payroll tax. Back in the 70s, I don't know what it was. The government um, <coughs> uh, salaries and volume of like 50% of the total expenditures. I'm guessing it's close to 40. No, it's 40% close. 30, oh, it's 40. It's because of the debt costs have gone up, but I mean. We've had on, on the recurrent side, let me answer that one first. On the recurrent side, if I pull that um, element up, we've had recurrent surpluses. We've never had GFS um, sur surpluses. And if, in layman's terms, if I take all expenditure and all revenues, whether it be capital or current account, recurrent, um, I've been told that since independence, we've not, right? That's GFS. On the um, recurrent revenue, less recurrent expenditure, we have had um, less than 10 years. So over that 40 year period since independence, less than 10 years, where we've had recurrent revenue exceed recurrent expenditure. Um, so um, at independence, we were economically, um, from the situation we were in great strength because we had the ability to borrow because we didn't have um, any levels of external debt. And unfortunately, um, our, our politicians became enamored with that and saw the ability to borrow with still low debt to GDP ratios. Um, going to your previous examples or the previous questions as it relates to VAT on government contracts and even payroll tax on government salaries, it, it's a bit of a wash um, because the government can pay itself um, so it just goes in two lines. The net impact to the deficit um, and government fiscal situation is going to be nil because they will have it as revenue and they'll have it as an expense. Um, and so we, we realize that and we hope they realize that. So in our modeling, et cetera, we do realize that any charge on the government is actually a, a net non-contributor to the economy from that perspective. Um, so with those two, it is understanding what the impact on a VAT, payroll tax and others would be on the non-government productivity and consumption. So that's what we focused on because we see the government, um, and I say it as a wash, it's not perfectly as a wash, but it's in and out. The personal emoluments, like I said, is about 35 to 40% uh, in that regard, based on what 
the budget summary shows um, in that regard, um, with about I think 20% going towards debt repayment and interest costs, uh, and then some other fixed costs. But when you look at it overall, it's about 40% on the personal emoluments, somewhere thereabouts. Sure. Last year. I don't No, no, I didn't say any of those. But oh, if you're saying how much is the um, the, the uh, servicing costs and those as it relates to total expenditure, yeah, those ones are about that same 25 and 35. That is correct. And you can see it in the budget with that one. But remember now, the recurrent expenditure is increasing. I can get the mathematics to you um, on that front. But from that perspective, they are those, those levels. Um, but bear in mind, on some of the government expenditure, you have program costs and you also have significant capital costs, etc. So you do have an inflated expenditure base. So when you look at those um, elements, some of that could be higher if I'm saying a lot of these outsourcing elements and the government corporations and those things that are not added in. So you do have that element. Last question, so you're the lucky lady. Yeah, this is a quick one. Yeah. Well, it's been, I mean, the, the PM in his closing statements of the mid-year budget has said that he's always used that, that, that term, it's not etched in stone or nothing is fixed. In, in all of the discussions, nearly all of the meetings with cabinet ministers have indicated July 1 is not going to take place. And even John Rowell in his indications now, the earliest he's seen it is October, is what he said. All right, so thank you very much. Many thanks, uh, Mr. Paul, for your presentation. Many thanks for the audience on behalf of the National Institute for your presence and your support. As a token of our appreciation, I have uh, two books. One for you about the ideas of Ayn Rand, one of the favorite philosophers yeah. of the National mm -hmm. Institute. And this you can give to your wife to show that Rick Evenings are not that kind of okay. evening. <laughs> it's called Ladies for Liberty. <laughs> then uh, I'm briefly I'm going to break an arrow for the pirates. The pirates had rules and they stick to them and violating them was painful for the violators. They couldn't borrow so they were very careful with the spending. No bankers would pay them any money, give them any money. They used sound money just they would accept only gold and silver, not the pieces of paper with chip ink and smell bad with photos of politicians. And finally, they did rob people, yes, I admit, but they had the decency not to say that it was for our own good. <laughs> F finally, finally, I am an economic refugee in the Bahamas. I escaped from a country that had BAT for more than 40 years now. It has started at 12%. It's now 23. It used to have several exemptions, not anymore. And when I escaped from there, they added income tax. BAT is the first of the intrusive, very intrusive uh, taxes because the tax police is going to come to your business and going to ask for documents. It's going to look what you do and make decisions on that. So it's sad, but I think Bahamas, uh, it's in the crossroads of a very important decision. There is a good road and there is a bad road. I hope you choose the best. Thank you.